Hi, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to today's edition of Best on the Web Masterclass. My name is Simon Ward uh, and I have the pleasure of having James Kennedy with us today. Afternoon James, how are you? Hi Simon, great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for, for being on board and doing this. I really appreciate the time that Everyone's giving to the Best on the Web Masterclass series. I'm really grateful for all that. Um, as I say, we're going to talk through the job search application, job application process from an employer's perspective. I'm not going to um, steal James's uh, thunder. I'll let him talk about himself in a moment. First of all, I'd just like to just set a couple of boundaries around how today's session is going to work. Well, not boundaries, exactly the opposite, actually. There are no boundaries. It's as simple as that. A very, very informal session. We want the people who have given up the time to come and listen to us talking about what things that we're very passionate about um, to get out of it what they can. So it's informal. Ask questions when you think of them. That's invariably the best time to ask a question is when you think of it. I'll get the chat up in a few minutes um, so you can see and you can communicate. You can let people know that you're available to connect. We can begin to build a little bit of community around the uh, Job Search um, Next Steps Masterclass. I'm keen to do that. We, we have a, a Masterclass group as well, which I'll probably pop up uh, at the end of the session. Um, if you want to ask a question, again, no daft questions, put a, a flame emoji or, or, or whatever next to put in cats, just so that as I'm looking through the chat, I can pick those out. And we can make sure we answer as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, if we are so unindated, 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 is that word? I'm talking like that. If we get a lot of questions, so what was the word, James? Inundated? Inundated. I just got the un in. Modeled up. Thank you. If, it, if I'm inundated with questions, if we are inundated with questions, I will um, make sure that James and I get back to everyone and we answer those questions if we run out of time, because I think that's really important. Um, and quickly, before we get into it, just a couple of words on next steps. Um, so these series of masterclasses, um, have been designed just to, to bring the next steps into people's consciousness. Next Steps is a charitable initiative that is being driven by a group of coaches, HR people, recruiters, and army veterans uh, to offer long term mentoring support and expert job search training to either people who are coming, going through transition, coming out of the armed forces, and that's all forces, or veterans. Um, it's a lengthy process to get ourselves registered with the Charities Commission. We're fighting our way through that at the moment. We will go live with a community interest company in the next probably month or so, maybe six to eight weeks, and then Next Steps will exist, and we'll start the process of delivering this support for people who we believe deserve it most. So that's the advert and the information on next steps. Um, so James, right. What, one thing that I have learned since I have been in the career coaching, job search training environment is that every coach builds a reputation and a brand for themselves. Mm. Um, so I have become the boring ball bloke and I think I'm pretty good at that. I think I, I, really, I think I've really nailed that niche. So, so I, I'm over here. There are others who are famous for for being the the LinkedIn guru or Mister or Mrs or Miss Smiley or or whatever. James is unquestionably the happy bloke. James has built this brand around the fact that we can go through what is a very very serious process job hunting, go through what is a very important part of our life, our careers, but there is nothing that says we can't have fun. And I have now known James for, I guess, about a year. He's become, I hope, a friend. I certainly regard him as a friend. He's a mentor. He's a coach to me. I've learned a huge amount, but I have never had a conversation with James without enjoying it and without laughing about it. So I'm really optimistic, putting the pressure on now, James, that uh, this next session for the next hour or so is going to run like that, informal, fun but also hopefully a learning experience for everyone who's involved. But James, as I said, I'm not going to steal your thunder. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, wow. So thank you for the uh, for, for the introduction, Simon. And um, I very much consider you a friend and uh, value advice as well. Even though you 
put yourself down as the old boring bloke. That's that definitely not true, right? Uh, so uh, first off, hi everyone, and uh, thank you in for tuning in. And definitely for anyone on this, right? Uh, I'm a big believer that what I'm presenting and what I'm sharing today should be of benefit. So rather than uh, you know just uh, being here for the hearing the sound of my own voice, please give me your questions. Give me what you got, and if you ask the question, I'll do my my best between Sam and I to make sure that we answer all the questions, right? Uh, so in terms of my career and how I've gotten here, right, a lot of it has been for the last 20 years in corporate and doing a lot of different jobs, not knowing what I wanted to do. OK, so, you know, uh, three redundancies, uh, seven different careers, as, they, as I've talked about before. Right. A lot of we do searching for what it is. Right. And then there's the pain of uh, not understanding what I wanted to do, what my purpose was. Right. And, and also, the, you know, getting ghosted, getting rejected. I've lived through all of those things. Right. Being stuck in a job for too long as well. OK. Uh, you know, being out of work for an hour, as well, uh, for an hour, that wish, getting out of work for a year as well. OK. So I've lived through the pain and the shame that a lot of people go through and, and my background you know one of the things that i've seen through all of it is all about process improvement simon right so for me it's like how do i make the process easier faster right take the shortcuts i'm always looking for shortcuts but also make it fun as well okay because you know <laughs> you know trying to make the job search fun right that's a statement right and i said but yes you can yes you can and i believe you can and a lot of it is all about um finding out about ourselves right and and you know as humans you know and in a lot of what i do simon is all about you know understanding human nature understanding psychology understanding marketing as well right because this is coming from a shy introvert most of the time simon that uh hates selling himself and marketing himself okay so i don't normally do things corporate because i don't know how to do things corporate and i only know how to do things my way right and with that comes the caveat that i'm not for everybody OK, because I'm too smiley and I should be serious and you should be all of these things on LinkedIn. I'm not right. And part of that is making up my own rules as I go along and, and, and looking at it from my perspective. Right. And, and, and Simon, I just want to say, just like yourself, and there's so many amazing, you know, uh, career coaches out there. Great. Right. All I care about. Are you getting the results you are? Right. And so there's so many different ways to land jobs. OK, none of it's not better than the other. It's just different ways. Find the person that you resonate with and go with that. Right. Because it's like I'm not going to be for everyone because I'm the jokey. Uh, uh, I'm always making jokes and, 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 you know, having fun. And that's just the way I am. Right. So I'm not changing for anybody. And I think that's really important. That And, and that's not just about life, not just about job hunting. It's 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 everything, isn't it? That we, yes. we have to be ourselves. I saw a great quote from from someone else's post that I, I relayed this morning, which is about the importance of not allowing those who feel they have a need to judge us to begin to influence the way we behave because no one knows our life and no one knows everything that we are doing to be able to do everything, um, which is a great, a, a, a great post. And I, I quoted that. And I think we just have to, to, to relax, be ourselves and, and be true to ourselves in, in terms of our aspirations and as well as the way that we behave as well and how we conduct ourselves. The fun bit is, is really, really important. We've got our, our first question. Let me just pop that up. Um, so even before we get into it, we're getting questions, which is fantastic. So I, I really appreciate this. Um, how to start job search for a young guy who's searching not only just a job, but who wants to grow up as a person. So we're talking here about progression and career creating a foundation for a life. What, what's your thinking on, on that, James? Wow, great question. And I'm going to attempt to say that name. All deals on. I'm um, apologies if I'm butchering your name there, but uh, thank you for that question and the first question. Uh, so, so that was me for most of my life, not sure what it is I wanted to do, not sure right. And, and you know, the thing about great thing about LinkedIn is, is there's so many people out there doing jobs that you might like, right? So the importance for me of LinkedIn is also all about building relationships. OK, if you don't know what you want and you're not only searching for a job, but someone you want to grow as a person, right? Look to see what other people are doing. And if you like any of them, look to connect with them, right? But when I connect with them, I always remind people, Simon, build a relationship first, OK? Yeah, you know, if you, uh, I get people sometimes uh, connecting and sending me their CV or their resume straight away, OK? I have no vested interest yet to look at that for you, right? Because you, all you're doing is looking after yourself. Right. There's no relationship building there. Right. So my, my suggestion is to look at the people out there and see what they're doing. 
okay? And if you like it, you know, uh, you know, uh, a lot of LinkedIn links, but comment on it, like what they're saying, right? You know, be visible on the post, but also send a connection request. And a connection request, if I ever send a connection request on LinkedIn, it's always with a message as to why you, um, why I want to connect, right? So something I liked about the post or something they said, right? And connect that way and build a relationship first, right? And once you start to build a relationship, it's like, hey, I love what you're doing. Uh, you know, I'd love to find out a bit more about how you got into that role or how you got there or what advice would you give to someone trying to get into something similar, okay? Because what we're doing, we're playing to people's ego as well. It's not about us, it's about them and you want to find out more about them. I think that's great. There's a number of points to unwrap there. Just ending where you, sort of starting where you ended, that piece about, you know, this isn't about ego. It, it's It's important that we understand that we are not always the single most important person in our job hunt. We actually need to consider those people who are going to impact the outcome of our job hunt. And what do they want? What can we do to make their lives easier, fit in with their process, accept the pressures that they are under, rather than constantly saying, well, I need this, I didn't get that. Let's move beyond that. The other point I would make to Adil Zahn is that I think you must be really, really honest with yourself and not be swayed by those around you. I, I had a, a father, I was talking to, to James about this earlier, I had a father that if I wasn't sitting behind a desk with a tie on, I probably wasn't at work. So I was brought up in this, this belief that those were the only jobs that really counted. And I look back now and I wanted to do something completely different with my life. I'm incredibly happy with the life I've got. I love my career, met fantastic people, seen some incredible companies, often juggled several of them at the same time. That's the advantage of, of, of being in recruitment and HR and consulting. Um, however, I wanted to work in elite sport um, and I got offered a job. It was There was a delay in the start date. In that time, I, I, I got sucked into a family business and never got out. And I've been here for two or three years ever since, a few years ever since. Um, my, my eldest son is now living my best life. He, he works for, for a Premier League football club. Wow. He's hugely successful. And I'm just jealous. I'm just looking at him. But as a parent, I hope, and this is the, the important point about this, is that he was allowed to have conversations with me that didn't mean he was going to follow in my footpath, footsteps. He wasn't going to become what I wanted him to be. He was going to become what he wanted to be. And, and I think that's really important. And a lot of pressure is put on parents to achieve that and mentors and, and you know, uh, role models. But the responsibility lies with yourself. To, to work out what you want to do. Not for the next 40 years. I'm guessing, looking at the picture, you're in your early 20s. It's not the next 40 years because you're going to have four or five careers. You know, that's, that's the future of life now, future of careers. You're going to have a number of careers. But what do you want to do? What is a great foundation for that pyramid that you're going to build through your career? So everything James said, ticking the box, agree completely. And then I'm chucking it back a little bit at you and going, well, a lot of the responsibility lies with you. Find out, be honest, and once you've been honest with yourself, go hell for leather what you want. Happiness is a really difficult thing to get. Yes. But I'm a great believer that careers are there to enable and empower happiness more than anything else. So yeah. find what will make you happy. Don't get yourself tied up in job titles. Look at the, the, the elements, the criteria that Love sit it. behind that job. Is it outside? Is it indoors? Is it on the phone? Is it with people? Is it wearing a suit? Is it not? You know, my poor dad, if I'd even said to him, well, dad, I've decided I don't want to wear a suit in 1978, 79, whenever it was, a thousand years ago. Oh, he wouldn't have got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, James. He would just wouldn't have got it. So that that that's our view, and I hope I hope that helps. We've had another question coming in as well. This is from from Colin. From a and this is exactly where we're going to go. So this is a great question, Colin. Thank great you. Question, Colin. Us into the right the right direction. From a recruiter or hiring manager's perspective, what is your view on the use of functional CVs to handle career gaps, sector change, and how do applicant tracking systems handle them? So. I'll hand that to you, James, because that's a hot potato, and I'll. I pick love up. it. I love it. Up. Brilliant. Okay, so 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 Simon, I'm going to work with you on this question. Great question, Colin. Thank you. Right. So Simon, here's a question for you, right, yeah. to help answer this. Right? I promise it'll come back. When you choose, when you look to choose a movie you want to watch or a book you want to read, how do you make that decision? 
See, I was going to be flippant then and say I, I'm, I'm told what my decision is. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that might resonate with a few at home. I don't know. I don't know. Um, okay, book. Have a book. In so terms usually, of a book. usually uh, 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 it will be because often it will be because someone has recommended something to yeah, me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone has said you ought to have a go at this. I have certain genres that I like. Yeah, I don't watch horror films, for example. I don't. I don't get that. Uh, I never have, but maybe I'm just a wimp. So I have genres I look at. I talk to people. I had a conversation on. Saturday with a guy called Johnny who when we recommended films to each other yeah. and we both watched at least one of them so far this week gotcha. um I also decide a little bit on what my mood is right right do I need gotcha. cheering up do yeah. I need something yeah. that's going to really it. focus me I use that stuff to try to clear out my mind sometimes what Colin would call showering your head um so yeah I guess that's how I choose is that the right answer yeah no no yeah I love that right because you so what you said there was a couple of things recommendations right on CVs and resumes, it's a, it's, 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 it's a referrals as well, right? And I come to that, right? The other thing as well, you know, this is a, if you know you want to read a book or, or something, if you don't have the friends or the recommendations, we look at the summary as well, right? You know, the back of the book to say, oh, yeah, this looks like something, or the genre, if it's the similar genre to what we're doing as well, as you talked about, okay? So I always say to people, your resume, your CV, right, for my friends across the pond, right, has to be that as well, okay? It has to have a summary section. It has to have the highlight section as well. You know, for people doing uh, uh, dissertations and all those things, it has to have a summary, a highlight section of why the person wants to read more of that CV that you've got. Okay. Now you talk about there about you know if there's a career gap or a sector change or the right. The thing I want to say to that is the, the challenge with COVID. It's it's more uh, um, accepted now that there's going to be a career career gap. OK, so if you're out of work, don't worry about it because there's so many other people out of work as well. OK, the one thing I always say to people is you want to lead the, the conversation where you want it to go. Right. The problem with a functional uh, CV as it currently is. Right. It starts with I've been out of work for this long. Right. And then the question, what have you been doing in this time? Right. And I say that the one way to do that is to have a highlight section before your career history, right? And I like to call it, uh, no, it's just words at the end of the day, choose whatever you want it is, but it's either a key accomplishment section or a, a key achievement section is what I when I work with my clients, okay? The reason for that section is to bring up from your entire career history, right? Because I've worked with people with a five-year career gap as well, things you've done in the past that's relevant for the job, right? So, uh, you know, uh, that, that's a huge question and it, and it can almost go almost different ways, right? But I always say to people, when you're looking at your CV, you don't start with your CV. You need to start with the job description. The job description, as I say to people all the time, is a cheat sheet, right? Because if you think about it, it's a list of problems, right? It's a list of that the company needs someone to come in and solve, right? The candidate's job is to convince the hiring manager, and I say hiring manager, recruiter, the HR person, that you are the right person to come in and fix those problems for them. Okay, and he talks about ATS, and I say to people, right, in in a in, in a uh, any CV, right, there's there's keywords in there, right, communication, teamwork, problem solving, process improvements. You want to think of them as all problems, right? They're problems. So I always say to people in the key achievement section, you want to use that same word to make sure you're beating the ATS, but also at the same time, each company has their own culture, have their own language, right? So you want to show up front when you're using their own language to your advantage when going back. So I would say communications, process improvement, right? That's what I, I, I like to call it signposting. You have that under key achievements, that's the header, okay? And under the header, don't talk to me about responsibilities you've done in the past, because I say to people, responsibilities come with the job. Right, that you don't own them. Your responsibilities and everything you've done in the past comes with the job. The next person that comes on the job has the same responsibilities. Okay, what makes us different is the impact we talk about, right? So our achievements that you've done in the role. So tell me about a problem that you fixed in the past, right? That's related to pr uh, problem solving, process improvement, stakeholder engagement, whatever your job is. We are dealing with people and and you know having to deal with conflict, right? So show me your biggest and worst problems where you've done it. The thing about this is when I talk about is uh, you showing them up front on your key achievement section what you can do for them before they look at your career history. OK, so if you have a career graph and all these things there and when I talk about achievements, put in there about the problem you solve, but also more importantly, what was the result? 
Okay. I always say to people, you're telling me a story. So what? My clients hate it all the time. You're telling me this. So what? Because I want to know the impact to, um, to uh, you know, have you helped to increase the sales? Have you helped, uh, helped to, you know, improve efficiency, right? Are you helping to meet regulatory requirements? All and every business out there have the same underlying challenges, okay? And so give me a problem and how it relates to how they've helped to improve business processes, increase sales and all those. When they can see that and they can see what the problem you're talking about, they're more likely to align your problems and what, what, you, what the problems you resolved in the past to what they need. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. And I think that that was a, a great synopsis of creating power from CV. Absolutely right. I, I would just add one thing to that. And and it's kind of really black and white. And, and, and I'm kind of hoping that people go, no, I'm, you're an idiot or don't be silly. My view is never use functional CV. Just don't use it. Functional CVs have become um, a, a mechanism for people who do what James and I do. Um, to give an alternative piece of information, a piece, different piece of coaching or advice if people have specific challenges. I'll put it into a functional CV. Um, all of those broadcasts, all of those LinkedIn articles are also read by recruiters and hiring managers. They get it. Three years, four years ago, I may have had a different view. But functional CVs are not attractive to hiring managers. They are not attractive to internal recruiters, HR departments, or recruitment consultants. Nobody likes them. It would appear except some recruitment, uh, some coach, uh, career coaches. Don't touch them with a barge pole. And don't try to hide. You know, I hear so much about, you know, here's a clever way to hide a gap in your career or... Um, here's a here's a clever way to answer this interview question that doesn't answer the interview question. It, it's it's a nonsense. People who are interviewing you, people who are reading your CV, do it on a regular basis. They are reading between the lines. They understand that there are functional CVs out there, and they have been sold into the market as the as the the sort of um, golden answer to to difficult problems they're just not stick with a chronological cv gives you an opportunity to build a story through your cv and that story might include include a career gap explain it talk about it yes i know and 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 colin and i'll put it back up just so you can see i can't see all of colin's question it's a lengthy question colin or when she observation is that some some cvs do get rejected because of career gaps but they're going to get rejected more if the recruiter hiring manager internal recruiter thinks you're trying to hide it or you've been clever about it it's a little bit like when you get asked that question in an interview um what what is your salary requirement and you respond, oh, market rate, as if the interview stops there. It doesn't. The next question is going to be, and how do you see your market rate? And you're still going to have to answer the first question, mm -hmm. but you come across as being a bit of a smart aleck in the process. So do the homework. Know what your market rate is and tell them how you value yourself. They might disagree with you, and that's fine. That's a conversation to have in an interview. But I think every time we try to avoid the, the 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 less powerful areas of our career history or the way we can present that, the more obvious it becomes that we're trying to hide the issue and therefore probably we're hiding more than actually there. So so my view is be honest and and be straightforward um and forget functional CVs. They 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 don't work. People don't like them. That 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 would be would be my view. Um there's some more questions coming in. So so my view, by by the way, James, is that we just answer the questions that come in. Go with it. I'm, I'm just going with it. It's cool. That's what, that's what we're here for, right, Simon? It's not yeah, right. absolutely. So, so Richard, thanks for, for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, are there common areas candidates fall down on during the application process, process from your perspective as a hiring? What a great question from your perspective as a hiring manager. Great question, Richard. Okay. And so uh, to help answer this question, right, as part of what I do, I speak with a lot of other uh, managers and, and I always ask them, okay, how do you find the hiring process? Okay. And I've had a senior marketing manager tell me straight up front, I hate it. Okay. So you guys watching this, you, I know it's t difficult. I know it's challenging. Okay. But on the other side, there's a lot of managers that I know it's, it's, it's necessary. We need to do it because we need the people in. But there's so many managers I, managers I speak to, they don't enjoy.
enjoy the process either. And what I want to say to that is because one of the biggest things that I see a lot of is that when I'm looking at people's, I, I always look at the job description first. Okay, because I like I said, I said before in some of my posts, I put myself in the hiring manager's uh, you know, position or the recruiter's position or the HR process position, right? They are looking for something, okay? And w w a lot of the times, the CV or the resume talks about yourselves, okay? And, and, and I'm just going to put this bluntly. From a hiring manager's perspective, we don't care about you yet. Okay, I'm saying we don't care about you because our responsibility is to make sure we have the best person and the right person to come in for the for the job. Okay, so when I read it, when I read an application, right, and it's talking about things that are not relevant for the job that you're applying for, right? That you told me that you got, uh, you you know, you, you think about it. The CV, the resume is about telling your story, but it's about telling your story to show the hiring manager how you can come in and help. The us, right? So a lot of the times, as you talked about earlier, HR people, they think they're having to read between the lines. They're having to second guess. They're having to look at all this and, 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 and do the work, right? You're making us work to try and figure out this guy looks amazing on a piece of paper, okay? But how does that help us, right? So when I talk to people and I, and I keep on going about it, if you give me the key achievement section, talking about the keywords and what we're looking for and give me your examples of it, things you've done in the past that's relevant for my job, I'm more than likely to want to read on. OK, the point about uh, the most CVs is if, if you're having it, uh, your best examples might be the bottom of page one or your best example relevant for the job might be the first job you did uh, five years ago, 10 years ago. OK, but it's on the second page of the key accomplishments there. Right. There's no guarantee that we're going to be getting to the second page. If the, the you know, we talk about first impression counts. Right. First impression counts. You know, it takes, uh, you know, uh, I've spoken to people. They tell me it doesn't take very long for us to make a judgment on people. Right. That's the same on a piece of paper. That's same when we're choosing a book. OK, we're not going to give it a, a second chance if you're reading the summary, we're looting all of this and it doesn't align to what we need. OK, I think, yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's key. Um, so I, I, I'm, I, this is fantastic for me because basically someone asked a question, I asked James to answer it, and then while James is answering it, I get time to sit away and think about what my answer would be. <laughs> Good, so great. I, Go with it. Put Richard, me on the hot spot. I, I, I've gone away, and there are a couple of observations I'd make. One about your question is that we talk about recruiters, HR people, hiring managers, as if there's some kind of singular amorphous mass where they're <laughs> all one group of people. And I can tell you after years and years of working with and being a hiring manager and working alongside hiring managers, every shape and description you could possibly think of lives in that in that community. Hiring managers are largely different. That's the, the one thing the one thing they're consistent about is that they're different. Okay, so so I don't want to give advice as if everybody is the same. And I would say that as you go through a process, and that process starts with the very first engagement, not when you get your CV in or when you walk in for an interview, but begin to think about that person as a human being as well as a hiring manager and begin to understand what will turn them on and what will turn them off. There are a few things that I have scribbled down that, that I think fairly consistently hiring managers HR people, recruiters, human beings don't actually like. Yep. One is pretending you know more than you really do. So I, I talk a lot about talking with authority about things you know little about, because you're probably going to be talking to an expert and they'll find you out really quickly. And once you have tried to expand your knowledge beyond <laughs> your base of, of experience and skill and you're caught, they won't trust you again. So stick to your knitting, stay in your lane, be honest about your skill set and be honest about what you know. Don't lie, absolute golden rule. No one likes being lied to. And once you have lied and you've been caught, everything becomes a lie. And if you're not caught and we're talking about an interview or we're talking about your CV, it can have repercussions in the future. So you can be caught and you can still lose that job. So that that's probably actually number one or that came number two. Thirdly, think about the time the point in the process when you ask for a LinkedIn connection request. Don't do it before an interview. You don't know them. No, take LinkedIn advice on this. Connect with people who you know primarily, especially when it comes to the interview process. We all fly beyond that, I think, um, more generically. But wait to ask someone to connect with them after 
the LinkedIn after the interview. They're quite comfortable knowing you've looked at their profile and they'll know you've looked at their profile when you walk in for an interview. But just hold hold still and wait until you've met them before you ask for that connection request. Really important. Um, you can separate you can separate yourself from about 85% of candidates and indeed human beings by just doing what you said you were going to do when you said you would do it. If you say you're going to sort of follow up with a with a reference or you're going to send a new copy of a CV in, just do it and set in the conversation when you make that promise, set a timeline and hit that timeline. It's really, really impressive because so many people don't do it. Um, I have to work really hard to do what I said I'm going to do when I said I was going to do it because I'm disorganized, but I know how good it, it, it looks. And then finally, the other thing that I know drives a lot of um, interviewers mad is when you don't answer the question you've been asked. There is some kind of assumption among um, some candidate communities, some, some uh, career coaches who I suspect haven't actually interviewed a lot of people, that an interview question is this sort of slightly vague thing that's there to be a platform to give you the opportunity to say whatever the hell it is you want to say in an interview. It's not. An interview question is very largely asked because they want to know the answer. And they're likely to ask the person who comes in after you or the person who went in before you. So you have a responsibility to yourself and your job hunt to give the best answer to that question. You're not a politician. This isn't Prime Minister's question time. You're not going to stand up and be asked question A and answer question Z. Answer the question you're asked to the best of your ability and then use the period at the end where you are asking the questions to begin to have conversations in those areas which you want to talk about. But give the interviewer the right to own the interview. Don't try to wrestle control back from the interview. They they know that's what you're trying to do and it just irritates. And I've had that feedback so many times from interviewers. Oh, God, the bloke walked in, he tried to take over straight away. And that's unless possibly a sales role. They tend that tends to irritate people. So they would be my key. They, they'd be my key ones on that, Richard. I, I hope they help. And, yes. and Simon, just to quickly add to that, I loved all the advice you give as well. So thank you. Uh, the the other thing that I want to say to 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 people as well is is uh, you know. Um, uh, when, you, when you're looking at your, your CV resume and how you feel about it right now, I always tell all my clients to rate it between one and 10, 10 being amazing. How do you feel about your CV resume, right? Okay. Now, a lot of the times when I speak with people because they have high standards and, and you, you know they've done all the things, right? I've spoken with students and the average is six or seven. I've spoken with senior directors and the average is six or seven, okay? And, 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 and I say to people a lot of the times, if a document you put together right and you rating it as the author as a six or seven how do you expect a senior manager to be looking or a hiring manager or someone in hr to see something higher than a six or seven from a document you put to uh, yourself okay so i always remind people that your cv your resume is not just for the hiring manager it should be a reminder to you of all the amazing things that you've already done in the past okay so uh, i said to me that is what you know that's your work that life you should be proud of it if you're not proud of your document right don't expect the hiring manager to see something higher than the six or seven that you don't see yourself right a lot of the times i see a one size fits all resume right and they try to put on the cover letter how they're different and why they want this role i say to people most cvs resumes are already two pages if i have a hundred applicants for one role that's 200 pages some poor person like myself has to review and read right you add a cover letter on top of that that makes it 300 pages i have to go for one role people okay so i say to people there's no guarantee that everyone some jobs are for a uh, cover letter some jobs don't okay but your cv has to be tailored for that role I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I, I think it's the single most important message that, that all of us in our, in, in our industry have got to be getting out to our, to our, to our clients and anyone who, who has put the time in to listen to us is tailor your CV. If there is a cover letter, tailor your cover letter. The job of your cover letter is a simple one, is to get your CV read. You're not going to get an interview on the power of your cover letter, yes. but it has a job to do if you're asked for one. Yes. Um, but that tailoring is key. And if you get your structure right, and in fact, I'm just going to a little bit of a, an advert here that, that, that one of the, the sessions I'll be running in the next two weeks on what we call the, the, the fishing rod sessions um, is about that structure that if you create fishing rods like that. So, yeah, it, it's the concept of, of, of 
give a give a person a fish, teach a man to fish. And we want to, to embed these life skills in people. And and one of the things that we'll be doing is we'll be giving a very clear, very defined structure for a CV that then enables you to tailor very, very quickly. Now, I understand people say, take me a day to tailor a CV, the job's not worth it. But if a job isn't worth 10 minutes, 15 minutes of your time to tailor your CV, and you can do that because you've got your structure right in the first place, then if it's not worth 10, 15 minutes worth of tailoring, it's not worth applying for. You don't want it enough, and you're going to lose. It's going to become evident as you go through the process. So that that's the point I'd make. The next question from from um, LinkedIn user, um, very secretive. Good, good use of, 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 of your settings on, on LinkedIn. Keep yourself private. That's fine. Um, is there a specific format that a, a CV should be submitted in? I've had lots of discussions with friends over PDF versus Word. More importantly, does it matter? And, and for me, that's the point. I don't know what you think, James. Great question. I don't know, to be honest, Simon. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I always, from my perspective, I always send it in PDF. Right. Yeah. But if you can see to some experts, they say that uh, the, the PDF sometimes doesn't go through the ATS system properly. Right. So there's a guy called Russell Ailes who's coming on to on to the um, best on the web mastermind series in a couple of weeks. He's, he's Australian. Many of you will know him. He did a phenomenal piece of research on applicant tracking systems and the only argument around what format is. So you know, the, the, at the end of the day, if a, a human being is looking at your CV, probably isn't going to worry too much whether it's Word or, or PDF. They, a lot of CVs are still printed out. Um, in the research that Russell did, which was really substantial, and I'm saying this off the top of my head, and I, somewhere like only 2 or 3% of applications that are managed through an applicant tracking system are managed through a system that doesn't have the ability to read a PDF. Now, that doesn't mean that 2 or 3% of ATSs only uh, don't don't have the the ability but if you look at the ATSs that are used more broadly the really successful ones the big ones those ones have that capability so they are you're not going to miss out in terms of the way that your CV is passed that is read by a computer be or very unlikely to miss out because you sent in PDF I agree with James. The upside of a PDF is immense. You have complete control over the format. Yes. Everything yes. looks the same. You put effort in to put white space around your bullet points. You've used a consistent bullet point icon. You've placed it with the same in, indent all the way through your CV. Maintain that through a PDF. Put it in a Word document. It can get corrupted. It goes all over the place. It goes horrible. I always use Word as an excuse when my formatting goes wrong. Oh, it's Word. It's not me. So I would absolutely that. Yeah. So 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 Colin's just come up. Yeah. Ninety seven percent of ATS, ATSs can read either format, and that is is crucial. I think the point that it just really in the cold light of day in 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 a data statistic based way. It doesn't matter. So I would go for control, particularly, and this is going to be slightly controversial for some of the guys who are, who are watching or who, who, who have um, joined us today, particularly if you're sending it to a recruiter. There are great recruiters out there, as there are everybody in every industry. There are great people who do a phenomenal job and could be trusted with your last fiver. There are also, as with all jobs or professions, there are people who can't. You wouldn't give them your last fiver. Why would you give them the opportunity to change your career history to fit their clients' requirements? And that's what you're doing by giving it in a word format. A million years ago when I was in contract recruitment, literally in the last century, we used to do what we used to call CV magicking, where we had a whole admin team who would fold CVs and photocopy them or use... Um, what was you say? Blue tech. It's not blue tech. What's that stuff? You used to white stuff. You used to paint over over type. Tipex. Tipex. You used to use Tipex all day and change things so our clients were more impressed. And then a poor candidate would have to walk into an interview and be sitting opposite someone who was looking at a document that they didn't know, they didn't recognise. Wow. It still happens. And a minority of occasions, it still happens. A PDF stops that as well. So my vote goes for PDF. Um. Hang on, so I'm going to I'm going to come back to comments, but I missed one. I'm I'm rubbish at <laughs> managing the chat. I'm going to visit this one. 
this one, yeah, from Sarah. I think this is this. I, Colin, I will come back to yours. Um, but Sarah, Sarah, thanks for being with us. How would you suggest a person writes a CV if they are changing careers and their history has not got the relevant experience? That's a great question. And you're going to answer it first. I'm going to think about my answer. So great question. Okay. And so uh, I just want to to help answer you the, that question, Sarah. The the process and the method that I've teach uh, I'm sharing today. Okay has helped teachers move out of teaching into corporate, right? Has helped uh, mechanical engineers go into digital marketing, uh, you know, uh, uh, transition. I, I specialize in transition and in, in going from one to the other, right? And a lot of these there, there's a lot of transferable skills from the job you've done in the past to what the job applications or job descriptions asking for, okay? So the process that I've talked about earlier is give me what the things that you've done in the problems you've solved in the past related to the competencies that we need. OK, so I look at this from a competency based space to view. Right. And, and, you know, if you look at the transition, you know, there, there's courses on Udemy and uh, obviously LinkedIn as well. And all this, there's courses to show your interest as well in the career that you're wanting to get into. OK, so you're not going into it. Um, you're not going to having no idea whatsoever. You know, you're doing the networking, you're, you're, you're taking some courses to understand that this is what you do, because the person on the other side to say is, do they just want another job? Why is it do they want this job as a hiring manager? Okay, so if I can see that you know uh, you're telling your story to see what you've done in the past, that's on how it relates to what I need you to do when you come in. You're taking some courses and all this. So all of this helps me see why, right? So the question, you know, uh, when you're looking to change careers, question from the hiring manager's perspective is why does this person want to come and uh, do this job, and why does this person want to come and work for us? OK, so a lot of it, you know, in your, on your CV and everything is when you talk about key achievements. Right. Uh, uh, um, and, you know, uh, there's a profile summary or whatever some people call it on the top needs to tell me why you want to be transitioning careers and why this is what you want to do. OK, to make it easy for me to see the connection uh, myself as a hiring manager, I need to see the connection as to why you're transitioning careers. OK, and the things that you're doing to help me to see why. Because you know, remember, at the end of the day, our CV is to get us an interview, to get us to the next stage, to get us to see one more about you, right? And there's so many people out there that have transition, uh, transferable skills, but just don't know how to market it from the perspective of what the hiring manager is looking for. Does it help, Simon? Yeah, I think it, it really does. And I think that we, that whole issue of pivoting, transitioning, changing career direction, I mean, I think it's come to the fore much more over the last 18 months yep. than it, it, it was previously. And people in the past were often doing it whilst in role. So they had they didn't have the urgency that I think a lot of people who lost their, their jobs through COVID had to do people who were in, say, hospitality or travel or, or, or holidays, etc. Suddenly had a need to get out of that industry because the industry was being decimated. I think there, there are a couple of things I, I would say is not everybody can do everything. So I had one of my big birthdays. I'm going to share which one. Okay, it's my 50th. And it was a long time ago. I had my 50th birthday. And that was, and it's weird. It, this is honest, absolutely the honest truth. That was the morning. On, on, on that morning, I woke up and I realized I was never going to be a professional footballer. How absurd is that, that I had to get to that stage? I also wasn't going to be a lead guitarist in a rock band either, which wasn't a surprise because I can't play guitar. But there were moments in my life when I just realised I'm not going to achieve something. So if you are looking to transition, you have to make that case to yourself first before you make it to anybody else. So look at the soft, transferable skills you have, the values that, you, that, that, that define you as a human being. And look how they apply to the new role that you're wanting to go, that new direction you're wanting to go in. But also through the process, if you are able to get an interview in that space, and it, you know, I think the, the advice that James is giving about CV is absolutely spot on. If you get that interview, don't try to hide the gaps because they're going to see them. Don't don't pretend that you know miraculously you knew, now want to do ABC. And that's something that you've been doing in your spare time since since you were a Boy Scout or a Girl Guide. They won't fall for it. They'll ask you questions you don't know the answer to. And then suddenly you'll become an invalid candidate. So be honest about the gaps, but sell yourself on those bits that are aligned where you can add value through your soft skills. But first of all, make that case to yourself, because I, I've had a lot of people 
come in. SAP, I, I worked in SAP in 1998, 2000. Then I got into, into the dot-com stuff. And I saw these guys who suddenly wanted to get into SAP in 98, 99, and then suddenly wanted to get into dot-com technology come 2000. And they would come in and they hadn't thought through their case. So first, second or third question I asked them, they were stammering and they were failing because they hadn't sold the idea to themselves first. They hadn't challenged themselves first. They hadn't done that piece of work. They went and found someone who did the job and sat down with that person for half an hour and find out what they thought and how where the failings were. So it is possible. It, and, well, it's, apparently I'm not going to be a professional footballer, but generally it is possible if you have the right foundations to add value and, as James said earlier, solve problems in your chosen, your new chosen career. And and I would support anyone. And and James, just turn your, your mic off away for a moment, James, because it's going to embarrass you, but I don't know anyone in the career coaching, career clarity, career confidence space that is better for someone who is thinking of pivoting, changing career direction than James. Wow. Well, and that's, it, it's an honest, and it's two reasons. You know, James eats his own dog food, literally. Um, no, not literally. That's a bad <laughs> use of the word. <laughs> don't have a dog, but thanks. <laughs> they're, they're words you just throw out occasionally. When you think about what they mean, you know, I don't mean that. But so James has transitioned and has pivoted a number of times through his life. He knows A, how to do it, B, how to do it successfully, and he knows the challenges. Um, so if you are thinking about that, I seriously would advise that you 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 link in with James after this session, have a chat with him, because as I say, he's he's absolutely top. Tier. I think all our career coaches, we have lanes that we add more value in than others. That is one that James is incredibly strong on. So I would I would absolutely suggest that. So thank you very much for your question. Thanks, if sir. we haven't answered your question, let us know. And, and we'll come back to you and we can talk to you about it in more detail. Because I think that's the most important things about yep. these sessions is that we get to the, the nub of the problem. Um, so and, and we try to solve problems. So that would be good. Back to Colin's question. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Sorry. There, that's Colin. This Great. One. I'm happy you're doing all of this stuff because I don't know how to do any of the... Uh... I, I have a thing called... I, so just, you know, we're talking about me now. I'm old. I can't play professional football. Part of that is my body's falling to pieces. So I have a thing called trigger finger. I don't know if anyone out there has got it. I've never heard of it before. But my fingers just lock up. It's like... Um, so so this is quite a challenge, working with both hands. You're doing, you're doing amazing, Simon. You're doing Thanks amazing. So much. See, that, that's why I love having James come on, on, on this series. Um, so Colin's asked a question. And I think it's a little bit of a, and I think Colin probably knows, it's a little bit of a piece of string question in a way. Um, how much tailoring should be done on a CV and how long should it take? Over to you, James. Love this question because I've had this same problem for most of my career unsuccessfully for the, for the first half, right? Now, I always like to say to people that the first half page of your CV, okay, is what needs to be tailored for the job itself. OK, because I say to people, you want to give the best of you on the first half page that if they don't read anything else, they've got everything else. They need enough of what, they're, of what they need to call you in for an interview. OK, and I always say to people, when you do get the interview. Right. The hiring manager needs to, uh, you know, putting out on the fires on a daily basis. Right. They'll get the email notification that you have an interview in 15 minutes. So they'll quickly print out the uh, quickly print out the CV and then go into the interview. Right. To go to you. Right. So they have to quickly skim about the questions and things they want to know about you before you actually come in. OK. You're making the job easier if you get in your highlight section and the best of you on that first half page of your CV. Right. And the point about uh, uh, that as well is that you're giving the best of you and it's it's aligned and it's in synergy to the things you want to be talking about when you go into the interview. OK, you're giving the best of you relevant to the job and which I call the highlight section, your key accomplishment section. And you're mentioning the things that you've done, the problem you fixed and the result. The how is they talk about in the interview when you come in for the interview. OK, so uh, and I always say to people that when you when you're looking to tell your CV for each job you apply for, set up a folder and s uh, leave that copy of that uh, CV in there, because with every job, even with the same job description, the nuances of each job is slightly different. Right. So I always say to people when you're talking about these uh, key achievements. Right. You want to be. Um, 
uh, as humans, uh, Simon, we try to save the best for last sometimes, right? And keep your ace up your sleeve. And it's like, you don't have that, uh, that, that because they might not get you to that question or they might not get to that, uh, that part of your CV. So give the best of you up front, right? And the way we do that, even if you, like I say to people, think of four or five com uh, competencies, keywords, problems that they're talking about. Okay, and and then look at them and say which is the most important for that job. Okay, so whether it's flexible, so okay, this one teamwork is most important, or uh, problem solving, or whatever it is, bring that to the top, right? So you get you can between those five, four, five keywords, right, that they need, and you're going to give you examples for, make it the most uh, important first, right? So you're giving the best of you first. Wow, that's amazing. How did you do that? How did she do that? And then go down, right? So everything is geared to what they want. And that's why you need to understand the job description. Okay. I think, again, all of those, and, and that that relationship between a tailored CV and a job description or a job ad is so important. Yes. Um, we talk about, and, and, and James and I talked about it this morning, we talk about, not there's a lot of talk about keywords. We, we like to think about key phrases as well. Yeah. So you're looking for those two, three, four fr word phrases. So if an organization describes something as a significant um, program of transformation, don't say a large change project use their language, use yeah. their words, because people like having their words fed back to them. That's one thing I'd add there. The other thing I would say is that the the outcome of a tailored CV is, is the end point. I think we have to look at where we start. Um, and what, what a, a lot of candidates do is they have a CV. And this is one of the reasons actually why I'm, I'm so opposed to CV writers generically, and I'm sorry if there are any watching, I, I, people who get paid for writing CVs, I don't get it, because no one wants or needs a single CV. They need a CV writing system, because they need to be able to move this through tailoring. What, one of the problems when you, you use that single CV and you tailor it for job A, and then you're gonna tailor it for job B, admittedly, yet yeah, hopefully, you've taken a, you've saved it in, a, in a, a decent protocol, so it's saved on your computer somewhere for that job, and then you use that base for your next tailored CV. It's like decorating a living room which has five layers of paint already on the walls. You can, yeah, of course, you can just layer another load of paint on top of it. Um, but I know a really, really good decorator called uh, well, Nobby. Um, that can't probably isn't probably the real name, but Nobby. And he will always tell you, if you're going to decorate a room, you strip the paint back, you get back. Now, if you have used the same living room wall and just paint it on top for your CV and that's your approach, it gets harder and harder and harder every time. So from our perspective, it's where you start and that's why we have a base CV, which is a, a repository of everything, every bullet point you could possibly put about your accomplishments, your skills, etc., and within individual jobs as well. And then you pair it back from there. So all you're actually doing, you're doing three things when you tailor your CV. You are taking information out that is not relevant to the role. You are reprioritizing the information that is left. So it is prioritized against the key requirements of the role. And then finally, you are adding probably in your what we call a solution statement, your personal summary at the top of your CV, you're adding two or three sentences, no more than that, but really early on in that summary, two or three sentences that are very specific to the major outcomes requirements of the role. And that's tailoring. And then you save it and you send it off. And then the next time you tailor it, you go back to your base CV and you strip down again. If you get your base CV right and you have all of your bullets and you have all of the points that you need and all those arguments you're going to make and they're aligned consistently with your, your messaging statements that comes from uh, an elevator pitch right at the start of your job hunt, 10, 15 minutes. It's 10, 15 minutes work to get to a decent tailored CV, maybe half an hour to get an absolutely king of the crop type CV. That would that would be my, my, my view. Um, think about where you start, create a system for CVs. Don't think you have one CV. Um, and if you're gonna use a CV writer to create the first CV, okay, but then build on it and use what you get back from your CV writer to create your base CV and then tailor yourself from there, would be my views, my, 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 my advice. Um, 
Uh, so let's have a little look, see what else. We want. <laughs> so Colin's trying to get us sacked, I think, today. So he's he's out there in Northern Ireland. Bring on I, the questions, you, Colin. Bring them on. I'll have them. I love them. I love them. Assume the weather's not good. So 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 Colin's going right. Okay, I'm going to send water. Really. So even even labels this one. So here's a contentious one. So I know we're in trouble before we even start. Do you think recruiters, stroke hiring managers, do sufficient prep before interviews or talking to candidates? Take it away, James. Here's my answer. It doesn't matter. Okay? Because, like I say, like I always say to people, each company is different. But the, uh, what's happening for sure is in the midst of trying to bring the, cur the current people, the new people to come and help him, they're putting out fires on a daily basis. So with the best of intentions and everything that's happening, you know, from the uh, uh, people are busy. OK, and this is just another thing on the job list of things that they need to do today. Find the right candidate. I got to do everything else as well. Right. Monthly payroll, everything else still needs to go happen regardless of whatever it is. Right. And I say to people, this is not something that you have control over. Right. So why worry about it? All we should be focusing is us and how we take control of us and what we can bring to the table and our preparation, everything. Everything else, we don't have control over. So stop worrying about it, okay? My point and things that I want to say to this as well is, um, uh, you know, uh, and just to add to this question is, I see a lot of posts on LinkedIn moaning about the hiring process, moaning about, uh, you know, uh, uh, terrible uh, recruiters out there, right? J just like in any in industry, there's going to be good pro hiring process and, and, and terrible hiring process, okay? You don't have control about that. But when you're moaning about, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, the process, you're not having that, just think about there's a potential hiring manager out there looking at this, and, and you might be getting likes because so many people are going through the same uh, challenges and the same thing, right? But from my perspective, perspective is how does that help your brand how does it help you as a problem solver because you're moaning about the problem not thinking about okay so this is how it is how do i learn to play the game how do i learn to be persistent how do i understand what hiring managers need and make their job easier so that i'm more likely to get an interview okay yeah. so it, it is a contentious one but i can't control it i can't control yeah. how other people do it so i'm not going to even bother because i have no control over that so sometimes there's disadvantages of answering a question twice, answering a question second, and that's because you just agree with everything that the person has gone, <laughs> gone ahead and said. Yeah, it, you know, absolute mantra is is focus on what you can control. Secondly, this this thing, and I'm so glad James brought it up. This thing about your online brand drives me nuts. So, and it's 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 an issue I think in our industry that at one level. We are telling you that activity on LinkedIn is really important and people are going to look at your LinkedIn profile. They're going to look at your activity. They're going to look at your posts, your articles, your comments. So that's really, really important. And then the next day we're putting up a post that is inspiring you or trying to capture you into some kind of campaign about how recruiters or hiring managers are failing you as a candidate. Now, I'm not arguing whether they are or whether they're not, because I don't believe there is a single group of recruiters, a single group yep. of hiring managers, employers. Just people, right? And how, people. how can you categorize and people? And some could be better than they are. I could yeah. be better than I am. Now, one of the reasons that I, I do the work that I do with the armed forces is that every single person I have met from the armed forces, whichever armed force you are, is a better human being than me. And I am privileged to spend time with them. So recognize that not everyone, in fact, no one is probably perfect. And that includes recruiters, hiring managers, HR people, etc. If you can't control it, ignore it. One thing you can control is the way you appear on social media. Stay positive. Ignore the... They're, they, they're kind of like harvesting posts, aren't they? They want comments, they want likes. And in fact, people are damaging their job hunt and they're being inspired to do it by people who are being paid to enhance your job hunt. And that really bugs me. I'll get off my orange box now. But yeah, that, that's, that's really, really important. Um, let's have a look at this one. So uh, Duzili, I think, I hope. Um, good afternoon. How would you suggest a person writes a CV if they're changing careers and their work system has limited relevant experience? So we sort of kind of touched on that a little bit. This is more specific, I think. Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, again, my question is: is right? 
the career that you change into or want to change into, okay, there's got to be some passion involved, right? Why is it? So uh, I'm a big believer that, uh, uh, you know, it's not just about the job, it's something you enjoy, right? So everyone that I work with, I challenge them, right? Is that, you know, I know we need a paycheck, right? But if you're changing careers, then you're already stuck in a job you don't want to do anymore. Make sure that you, you, you the job you're going into is not jumping, leaving one fire to go straight into another fire, right? But the thing about it is, what are you doing besides looking for work? to show people that you're passionate and you're really, really interested in the chain. Are you volunteering? Are you speaking, you know, networking? Where do the people that you, you know, uh, in terms of networking, where are the people that are doing the type of jobs you're doing? Congregating, yeah. right? And, and, and I understand, okay, so they're part of this, so I should go join in there and I should know to network in there so they can see your passion for what you're doing. Right. I always say to people when I'm uh, 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 looking to hire people, right, I always look at three things, right? Can they do the job? How can they add value to our organization? Okay. And can I work with them? Right. Because the thing about it, humans hire humans. Okay. And we are more likely to help people we like. Right. So with all of these things, be around the people and, and, and say, you know, courses you're taking to help you get the career stuff. But I always say to people as well is you need to understand the value of the work you've already done as well. Right. And like I said, I've worked with senior directors all the way down to students. Right. They don't have a lot of experience. I say, yeah, but think about the coursework you've done. Think about the problems you've solved. Right. You, you know, my my view is the, the, the only difference between uh, an, an entry level person and the CEO of a company is the level of complexity of problems they're solving. Right. So you need to understand the problems that you're solving and the value of solving those problems. OK. And that's how when I'm helping clients transition, you did this job, you did this work. OK. How, uh, did that help to improve the processes by percentages, metrics? How much? OK. You increase the sales. Right. Because when companies, all companies need to make money, need to make process improvements, need to meet the regulatory requirements. So whatever the things you've done in the past, Think of how it's helping and making an impact so that they can see that what you've done and they can see, see the connection of how you can use that in our company as well. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I think that just adds color and value to, to what we said before. Just want to pop this up um, from Colin. Um, uh, and, and, and Colin and I, well, Colin's significantly younger than me, so he is a young member of the audience. <laughs> uh, but then most people are significantly younger than me. I'm fine as I get along. But this is a really important point. And it's about metrics. Um, so one recommendation for, dare I say it, younger members of the audience, keep a record of achievements with metrics to build into your CV. They are essential. That is such an, we, we talk about evidential data. It's so, the data gives a feeling of scale of your responsibility, your authority, yes. your growth, Tell stories. scale of everything you've done. And, and yes. so, so important. I would also add, the only bit I would add to that, as, a, as a, a simple addendum, is a great place to put those key pieces of evidential data, those key metrics, is into short, sharp bullet points that are organized. I, I did a session on bullet points a little while ago, and I learned a lot as well in the research towards that. But I, I do say to, to all my guys that <clears throat> if a bullet point is more than two lines long, it's not a bullet point anymore. It's a short paragraph with a dot at the front. So keep it short and sharp. That's its job. Get some evidential data into it, some white space around it. And also one thing I didn't know before I did that session was build your bullets in groups of three or five. There's a lot of psychological research out there that suggests the human eye likes a central point. So it likes going somewhere where it goes to, you know, oh, go to interesting. two and three or three and five. Uh, and then I'll we'll... take that. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, a pleasure. Okay. I, I, um, um, I'll yes. bill you later. Um, so, <laughs> no, so, so Simon, so, yeah. just a quick one on that one. Uh, sorry, yeah. uh, Simon. Right, uh, uh, Colin. Great recommendation. Thank you for that. Right, when I work with my clients, I tell them to have a file of awesomeness, is what I call it. Okay, because these achievements is a record of all the amazing things you've done in your career. Right now, we're going to have horrible days. We're going to have terrible bosses. We're going to have you know terrible clients and a bad days around. Right. Okay. And 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 you know sometimes it's like you need to pick me up from all of those things. Right your record of achievements can help you remind, yeah, I did this, I did that, you know, give, and it, it takes the emotion out because it's all about factual information that you've done in the past that you made an impact and shows you this is the difference you made in the previous companies, okay? So it's a, it's not just for recruiters, it's for us as well. Now, this, uh, th this uh, record that you're putting together, most people will have to go through a, a yearly performance review as well, okay? Now, 
I, I always say to people, it's not your boss's responsibility to remember how amazing you are. Okay, it's ours. So we need to learn to take care, take control of our story and remind the bosses in these reviews and before the reviews and everything. This is what I did and this was the impact. Okay, so we need to take responsibility, take control of our career as we do that as well. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think in some ways, the the more robust your career has been, and some people will evaluate robust by period of service. So, so the longer you have served in your current or most recent employer, the harder it is to write a CV if you haven't done exactly what James is talking about. Trying to remember the, the budget of a of a project, the number of people on a project team, the, the the number of deliveries that a warehouse managed that you were a part of, the number of calls that came into a call center three years ago when you were responsible for a particular team, whatever that data is, get it written down somewhere because you will need it when you when you move jobs. I think that's one of the, the tough things. And I, I talk to a lot of people who are, and it begins to get them very flustered that they can't remember yes. What the, I can't remember yes. last Tuesday, so I understand it. You know, that's fine for me. Um, so I, I get that. Um, we've been running for, for just over an hour. Um, hopefully, I think we've answered all the questions that we've been asked. This has not gone through the carefully and planned process that James and I had done, and it's been brilliant. And there I'm was a plan, plan, Simon, sir. Thank I had you a plan. Me. I had a plan, man. It was all organised in here, even in, on a notebook. And and it's been, and, and the, the level of engagement has been fantastic, and I'm really grateful for the questions that you've asked. And the event page in LinkedIn stays open now for, I think, 28 days, or it could be there forever. Um, so if you have more questions, pop me there. James and I'll keep an eye on it and we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, James, have you got a few more minutes? Go. I'd, I'd quite like people to understand what you do and where they could go to get you to do it for them, if you've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah thank you, Simon. And uh, So, you know, uh, f from my perspective and what I'm doing, having changed careers seven times, I always say to people, uh, from my experience of that, is, 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 is the importance of getting clarity of what it is we want to do with our life. Right. You know, I'm a big believer in making an impact and, and, and you know, and, and, and something building something bigger than us and, and our job, especially when you spend so much time at a job. Yes, I know. And I'm a realist as well. We have to pay the bills. We have to look after our kids, you know, and responsibilities and the bills and everything. OK, but when you keep on looking and keep on searching and keep on going out of your comfort zone to find the job that you really enjoy and, and, and you want to have fun with right that's where you're going to be increasing your value right and also at the same time um have more fun right because i'm all about having fun and when you're in the right job it's not you know uh, there's a there's a quote simon it says you know if you do what you love you never need to work another day in your life right and through all the pain and struggles and challenges i've gone through through the job search uh, process i'm always looking how do i make this faster quicker and take the shortcuts i need right and that's what i help people with okay so anyone wants to connect uh, uh, you know there's my uh, linkedin uh, um uh, LinkedIn profile there to connect with. Want to chat? I'm happy to chat with everyone. That's not a problem. That's what I love doing. What I do is I just chat with people, right? And uh, yes, I also have a $97 course as well that uh, my clients have uh, used uh, to, uh, and it comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. Everything I'm talking about, templates, cover letters, everything, it's all in there, right? And, you know, I said, if you don't like it, don't worry, just tell me it's rubbish and I'll get it back. Hasn't done yet, but that is always going to be a first time for everything. So thank you very much for this opportunity, Simon. James, it's been a pleasure and you're not going to get away. We, we, we're going to do this on a regular basis. So I've loved this and, and, and I think it's been really valuable. And being able to just go wherever you know, your questions take you, yeah, yeah. That's, in your guest. that's the fun bit. Great pleasure. I you don't it. know what's going to come really up. Really enjoyed that. Um, if everyone, keep an eye out for next steps, uh, particularly if you are currently uh, in the military considering transition or if you're a veteran, we're very, very keen to offer you support when that all comes together over the next two or three months. Um, and as we end this, I'm just going to put up a, a holding screen which talks briefly about a thing called the Job Search Gym, which we are launching on Monday. It is a completely free job search coaching program, um, seven days a week. Every day we will be putting up coaching um, material and coaching sessions, sometimes recorded, sometimes live, uh, in a structured way. So we work through a, a structured job hunt. It's there. It's it, There's a group on LinkedIn. There's a group on Facebook. 
um, welcome to jump in at any time. We also have a live Q&A every Monday morning. Uh, this Monday we'll have the kickoff at 11 o'clock, but each coaching session is 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 uploaded or broadcast at 11 o'clock each morning. Um, and then we have a Q&A on regular Monday mornings just to get everyone up and running and answer a few questions. So that's the job search, Jim. James, it has just been a fantastic pleasure. Thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed it. I'm very grateful for your time. and your yes, Simon, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And I also just wanted to say uh, thank you very much for everyone watching that's, you know, taking the time to put a question out there. Because, uh, you know, a lot of what this is, the part I love fun is helping to answer people's questions there and there. And there so then I don't have to do any prep. So this has been great. <laughs> it's brilliant, yeah. We'll, and and I will persuade James to come back and do this again, and we'll 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 pretend we have a topic, and then we'll just open it up to everything that yes, anyone wants to talk definitely. about. Definitely. So so most of all, I would just like to say thank you, um, and thank you for giving us your time. We 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 never forget the privilege it is to to have people give up their time and listen to us. So I'm very grateful. I hope you've had some value out of it. Love it, love it. Thank you very much. Masterminds every week. And um, so that's it from me and James. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in a week or so. Cheers. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.